blue. Also, uh, it's been a crazy day, but a fun day. I started my day at 9 a.m. today uh, in the Atlanta airport. I'm supposed to come to Chicago and work from Half Rocket for today. At 4.30, I finally got to board my plane. Uh, apparently, the weather is bad in Chicago, and that's why I wasn't allowed to come. Uh, but it doesn't look that bad, so I'm a little confused as to what happened. But I'm glad to be here. Thank you for, for having me. Uh, it's a really, you know, interesting time in Elixir, interesting time in, in React. I think, you know, the goal for today was to talk about uh, how we can build mobile applications using React Native and Elixir and kind of bridge those two gaps or two worlds together and do some cool stuff. I'm glad to see Dorian talking about sockets and web sockets and channels and Phoenix because that kind of lends itself to the conversation that I hope we'll have today. Um, my name is Osa Gaius. Uh, I work for a company called MailChimp in Atlanta. We do email marketing and marketing automation. Before that, I worked for a company called Luma that made Wi-Fi routers. Uh, and you know, the interesting thing there was we made routers and we ran Elixir on the physical devices, people's homes, and Elixir in the cloud. So it was kind of a you know end-to-end -end Elixir experience for me every single day. Uh, that got me hooked on Elixir. Went to Elixir Conf last year. Uh, Elixir Days, which is where I met Dorian uh, and the rest of the guys here. And I'm really interested now in like even though Elixir isn't my job, uh, maintaining my connection with the community. So in Atlanta, I run the Elixir Meetup in Atlanta, and uh, I try to do open source stuff on the side to make sure that the Elixir community keeps growing. Uh, the sort of outline for, for this talk is as such. First, we'll do a brief introduction. Uh, we'll talk about functional programming, although like, I'm gonna assume that since you all work here for, well, best, best question, who here works at Hashrocket? Oh, so a small number. Who here does Elixir full-time? Ooh, even better. That's good. That's very good, actually. I was hoping there's some of these concepts would be new to some of you, so I, that would be good. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about functional programming. We'll talk about reactive programming and what that means. Uh, and that will help set up our discussion of React Native in particular and Redux. And then we'll kind of move quickly into Elixir and Phoenix. Uh, I'm going to move a bit fast through numbers two uh, to number seven. We can get to a demo, which is number eight here. And we'll kind of see what the application that I worked on looks like and kind of demonstrate how some of these concepts kind of play out. And then we'll conclude and uh, drink some more beer. So, excuse me if I drink a lot of beer. I'm really thirsty. I should have got water instead, but uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so the obvious question, right, is why, why build native applications with React Native? Why use Elixir as sort of the, the web server for these applications? Uh, why, why build real-time apps in the first place, right? Why do these things matter? And I think there's sort of two axes that I think of these along. The first is demand, right? So when I think of demand, I think of user demand, right? So think about users today. They expect an experience like Slack, the exper experience like Google Docs, right? They want to make a change on this page and expect the change to like automatically be seen by everyone. I think this is the experience our users expect today. And so as a result, businesses also have this constraint, which is, well, our users expect X, so how do we provide X? For a developer, that means that you now have to build real-time apps by default because your boss expects you to or the users you're trying to serve expect this from you. The second is that uh, in terms of demand, people expect, especially businesses expect, that when you deliver an application, it should by default run on everywhere, right? They expect you to build a web app, but it's also to be on mobile, but they don't want Android only, they want Android and iOS. And so there's a man on you as a developer to always build things that can run everywhere and can you know, handle uh, different user expectations. So with this in mind, we sort of have to find new tool sets, right? We can't hire an Android dev and an iOS dev and a web dev uh, and also a backend developer for every single project. So how do you kind of, as a single developer, bridge the gap or small teams bridge the gap uh, and kind of meet user demand? The second sort of why uh, I think of is rapid prototyping. And what do I mean by that? I mean, in the context of startups or consultancies, you have this problem, which is, hey, uh, I have this amount of money, and I need this in four weeks, right? And so you need to quickly build a solution and deliver it, uh, either because you're a startup that has something to get out to the market, or because you're working for someone and they have a fixed budget and a fixed timeline. And so how do you build things that you can deliver great experiences with that you know, meet user demand, as you mentioned before, and exist in multiple platforms in a time scale that makes sense? And I think Elixir and Phoenix have sort of demonstrated the capacity to help you do that uh, and to skill applications. But I think React Native is also a way that we can uh, think through how to kind of do that uh, in a more rapid fashion. Uh, one last point on rapid prototyping is 
oftentimes people will make the, the claim that you should use tools to prototype with because they're good for prototyping. And I think the nuance there is the tools you use to prototype with should allow you to take your solution and deploy it to production, right? Because every app that you say you build in two weeks will eventually get deployed to production, although you say you need more time. So the key nuance here is we have to build these applications to make sure they're real time, make sure they're cross-platform, but also make sure they're resilient over time, right? And they don't have a lot of bugs and, and, and they're not getting slow over time. So I think React Native and, and Elixir provide a useful kind of gap there. So let's kind of quickly move through functional programming. Uh, any questions before I move along? Cool. So quickly, uh, what is functional programming? For those of you who are not already aware, uh, the main difference here is that you know when we program, usually in an imperative style, we sort of have classes and objects, and we can modify their state. That's so cool. We don't have that in Atlanta. <laughs> Trains don't come by. Uh, they're <laughs> underground. Um, I missed, in New York, when I lived in New York, we had that experience where you see trains come by. Uh, so, pure functions. Pure functions are different from impure functions in the sense that impure functions take some input, return some output, but during the state of execution, they do some other magic, right? So you can think of here, uh, the function square, it takes some input x, it says it's gonna square x, it does that, returns some output, but during execution, it also updates some stuff in the database, right? So that's a classic canonical example of a impure function. It does something, but however, doing execution, it also modifies the state of the world in some way that you may not be aware of, right? Or other functions may not be aware of. A pure function, by contrast, takes some input x and returns some output, and that's all it does, right? It doesn't do anything to the world. It doesn't make any changes to the world. Input, output, input, output. Uh, a sort of different example here is square all that maybe is a bit more nuanced. This is sort of a, a JavaScript function. It takes some items, and it's supposed to square all the items Within that, uh, within that collection. However, it modifies the collection in memory, right? So it takes that collection that's in memory, it does a squaring, it eventually returns to you a new collection with the thing squared. However, it does some modification of the array under the hood. Now, that's dangerous because if someone else needs to you know, be aware of what that thing in memory is or you need to pass it to someone else, they aren't aware now that some changes were made to the object already. By contrast, a pure function or a pure version of square all simply takes that existing uh, items collection maps over it or creates a new copy of it and returns that to you along with its operations. So the sort of key sort of difference when thinking about pure functions and functional programming and why it matters is the, the key difference here is that your functions should allow the world to be fundamentally immutable, right? You shouldn't change things in the world during the state of execution of your functions, right? Your functions should do things. More importantly, your objects and the things you pass around, the value should be immutable. So if I have some object X and I want to do something with it, I have to make a new version of X. So this is a fundamental property of functional programming. It's immutability, right? You shouldn't be able to change things. You rather should make copies of them and pass those copies around uh, each time. The second principle is that you should share nothing, right? So if you have one function doing something over here and one function doing something over there, they shouldn't really share anything in common, right? They should do with, you know, do with their inputs what they will and return outputs as opposed to fundamentally changing some underlying state. What this allows when building applications is that applications, as they get more complex, right, the complexity is something you can still keep in your mind, right? It reduces the overall complexity because those functions are indeed very simple, right? Input, output, input, output. You can reason about them, you can reason about what they're doing. You can chain the functions together, but each of those functions is still easy to reason about. And I think this point about reduced complexity, again, is really important, right? If you're prototyping, if you're doing something in two-week sprints, four-week sprints that you're gonna release to a client, being able to prototype a big application really quickly, uh, but also have very, very sort of complex things within there that you can still reason about, I think functional programming gets you there much better than, let's say, an imperative stop. So, any questions about functional programming before we move forward? Cool. Now, uh, reactive programming. Who's here has heard about reactive programming? Okay, okay, it's a good number. So, I, I think of reactive programming as sort of this you know, old computer science, like neckbeard kind of thing that's had a resurgence in the last, you know, couple of years. Like very big in the 70s and 80s, uh, very big in sort of big, uh, you know, projects back in the day. But when I think of reactive programming, I think fundamentally about two things. One, 
uh, how do you model events that are happening, right? So an event happens, another event happens, another event happens. How do you model those events over time, right? Because everything occurs in time. So you can think of events as occurring one after the other. So how do you think about them uh, in a way that lets you reason about all those events together? And this brings us to you know, the canonical example of a stream, right? You can think of this here as a stream of events occurring. This in particular is a click stream, right? So you have a stream of events, the arrow being representing time here, and each of these clicks be modeled as individual events in time, right? Along a stream of time. And you can say, well, this one happened, that one happened. You can you know, take a collection of events. You can say, you know, I only care about these two and not these two. You can replay them or replay time. You can go backwards and forwards because you have some notion of time or some notion of stream. The sort of important thing when thinking about reactive programming, in, in, my, in my thinking when building applications, is it forces you to think about your data flow, right? So how does the data or the state in your application come to be, right? So let's say something is showing on the screen. The screen says OSA. How did that come to be on the screen? Most of the time it's just like, well, I did like a jQuery thing that like dot show and it showed up on the screen. But the real question is like, how does that move from your web server all the way to your front end? And then how do changes then make their way back to the web server? Reactive programming, I think, allows us to think about, well, you know, everything happens in a stream, right? So the web server sends a message, the message comes back, you show on the screen, you handle click events, and those flow back to the web server. So the way I think about reactive programming when thinking about building applications is, well, how do you think about the stream of your application, right? Is there a stream? How does your data flow within the application? Can you map it along a line like this? If you cannot, then that probably means you have a bunch of random complexities and a bunch of random state mutations. However, if your program is fundamentally functional, it's fundamentally reactive, then you can say, well, hey, here is how this thing came to be on the screen. Here are all the events that happened. You know, maybe a web server call, again, gets pushed somehow through a web socket. However it happens, but here's a stream of events. And when something changes in a web server, here are the stream of events that made that occur, right? Does that make sense? Any questions there? We'll dig a little more because uh, Redux, which is the, the React library, heavily, heavily borrows ideas from reactive programming, uh, but doesn't make it explicit, right? So I think reactive programming is helpful to understand uh, when you're trying to grok reactive programming in the context of Redux. So that brings us to React Native. Who? Uh, quick question. Okay. So there's like Flux as well. Exactly. Is Flux just based off of reactive programming, or is it like its own flavor? Uh, yeah, Flux is Flux borrows a lot of ideas from reactive programming. Uh, there's a subgenre called FRP or functional reactive programming, uh, popularized by people like Google who came out the Reframe paper a few years ago. Uh, and so Flux is implementation of functional reactive programming, but doesn't really make that clear unless you read like the original like documentation around it. So uh, I think it's very helpful when thinking about Flux and then Redux, which is implementation of Flux, to go back and read the original uh, FRP articles because they help contextualize like, hey, why do we do all these things in Flux? Uh, Redux takes that a bit more to the extreme. It's a lot more opinionated about uh, reactivity and, and immutability. Uh, but I think Flux is kind of the first step and then Redux obviously fills on top of that. Uh, there's a document called the Reframe paper. Uh, just Google Reframe or Re-Frame. Uh, and the, maybe the other keyword is functional reactive programming. Um, and I can send it out to, to Dory and you can pass it around. Like they have made this <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it, so here's the thing. It, it originally came out of some of the folks who were working uh, at Google and then some folks from the Clojure community kind of like melded with them. And so it's still pretty restricted to the Clojure script community to see people talk about functional reactive programming. But it is the basis for Redux and uh, to some level even a lot of parts of React, right? But it's just not popularized. Cool. All right, React Native. So React Native is a cross-platform JavaScript framework thing. Right? It's, a, it's a bit of a hodgepodge of tools and some parts of frameworks, some language tooling. Uh, but you think of it as React but on a native device. Who here has played with React Native at all? Awesome, yeah. It's, it's, it's really magical. Um, the sort of key difference between React Native and other sort of platforms is, well, you know, you write your JavaScript, right? But similar to Ionic and so on and so forth, it promises that you can run that everywhere, right? But it doesn't use web views or any of that kind of silly stuff. It actually takes your JavaScript code and compiles it down to stuff that runs on a JVM, on an Android device, and stuff that runs on iOS, right? So it actually compiles down to code that 
existing device. In fact, on Android, you can open up the Java code and like look at it and be like, hey, this doesn't make sense. You can actually write native JavaScript or native Java code or native iOS code and it'll actually kind of mail with your application. So it's a truly native experience, right? Uh, and obviously uh, can be really powerful because it means your applications are a bit more responsive and fast than let's say a web view or something like Ionic. Question? Uh, do you uh, sacrifice performance, which is the case of the recording, is it like native? It's as native as you'll get, right? Uh, so you know the performance overhead you get from something uh, a lot of other cross-platform cross -platform, uh, sort of frameworks is they eventually compile down just like a web view that runs on the device, right? Whereas here, you're compiling to native, and so you kind of skip a lot of the performance hit you would take by trying to run a web view on top of the device, right? Um, yeah, that's, that's probably the best way to think about it. There, there, is a, there is a bit of a performance you know, hit you take, but it's not even noticeable when you're doing really cool stuff. Questions? Okay. So again, the power of React Native is, well, I build my application once, I write the same JavaScript components, uh, the same JavaScript classes, they look like React, they feel like React, and then I can you know, immediately deploy to Android devices and iOS devices. That again comes back to, one second, that comes back to our initial thought around, well, how do I prototype quickly, how do I release things quickly, and more importantly, how do I release things that aren't buggy, that aren't slow, that aren't you know, very, very terrible experiences that your client's like, hey, you promised me an iOS app, and this feels like not an iOS app, right? So I think that's the value of React Native uh, as a cross-platform tool. Question? I just want to mention that just because it's cross-platform, like you just mentioned, doesn't mean uh, essentially that you can't write the same code that you expect it to run across all devices. You have to try to adjust the code. Yes, you do. And, and we'll see an example of that here and kind of think about, well, how much code do I need to adjust, right? Uh, I think. What you'll find in many cases when building most apps that you deliver to clients in the context of React Native is you need like very little, if at all, any changes to your application, right? And that's really powerful. The cases in which you need some changes are very like fine things like, hey, I want this header to look like this uh, on Android as opposed to like this. Um, and that, that's really powerful because out of the box, you get cross-platform stuff without the need for a lot of changes, right? And so we'll kind of look at an example of what that looks like. So again, as I mentioned before, the key difference here between React Native and other sort of applications or approaches or the key value of it is the same JavaScript components that run on the iPhone also run on Android and you can reason about them as the same pieces of code and there aren't a lot of branching or decision trees. The more important thing is again, you don't need an iOS developer or an Android developer, or you don't need both of them, you just need uh, one you know, React Native developer and you kind of get at the work you need to do. So the sort of tie-in here is that in React Native, or as in React, as usual, all your components, or the things that get rendered through the screen, are just functions, right? They're just pure functions that take some input and return some output. There is some notion of state in React that we'll avoid uh, entirely because it's not awesome uh, in the context of this talk. However, most uh, approaches to building React and React Native applications assume that every component, everything that renders to the screen is just a function, right? You pass it some input and it returns some output. And the output is usually something it should display. So here's a good example. So here we have uh, a React Native class called my, or why React Native is so great. I just stole some documentation. And as you can see here, it has one function. Uh, and the function that we care the most about is the render function. It's the function that gets executed uh, similar to React whenever your component gets loaded uh, onto the screen. So when some, someone pulls a device up, uh, you have a class defined there that should show the first thing that happens is that class's render function is called and React says, hey, what should I render? Give me some output. It passes it some input, right, props or properties. In this case, there are no properties. And so in this case, it would simply render a view with some text within it that says some things you care about. If you had some properties or some inputs passed in, like a name or something, you could destructure those and reference those in your output. But the key difference here is that this view and the render method simply returns some text or some output to the screen. It doesn't do any magic within it, it doesn't change anything. So you can think of this as the ideal pure function, right? Give it some input, it returns some output. You can also reason about how exactly the output was produced because you can look exactly at it and be like, hey, this is what gets injected there, so on and so forth. Any questions about some React? It looks very similar to React. So who's played with React here? Right, so it looks very similar to React. It, you know, it feels like React. 
we're importing some different things on top, some text and view from React Native, but the rest of it is just React code. So let's skip to Redux quickly. Uh, Redux is, you know, the global kind of state approach that has become popularized in, in React, in the React ecosystem. Uh, it can be used with Angular as well, uh, but we'll kind of focus on, on, on the React ecosystem here. So, you know, think of the example where you have two kind of common classes. That is, I'm still, still going to trip out of that. Uh, you sort of have two classes, right? Class A and Class B, and they have some state they need to share between each other, right? The common way you would approach that is to have like a higher order component and then that higher order component and then you just kind of eventually have more components that are eventually higher and higher. Uh, but the kind of the way to think about that is, well, if I have these two components and they need to share some state between each other, is there a third way? Is there another way to do this? And I think Redux is the classic canonical approach. Well, you know, abstract that state elsewhere and then each of those components can get their props when they need it by simply saying, hey, global state, give me something. More importantly, in the context of Redux, because that global state, right, that global store is immutable, it's read only, right, it can only be modified by sort of changing it using functions, right? So you pass the global state to a function, and you tell it, hey, do this with it. It does that thing and returns you a new global state. So Redux is sort of a key example of functional programming in the sense that you pass it some input, it returns you some output, and that is the only way to modify the global state of your application. More importantly, because you're passing things in and out, right, and you're sort of chaining those together, you can think about how your application state changes as inherently reactive, right? So a function gets called and that changes the state in some way. Another function gets called and that changes the state another way. And so essentially the changes of your application state over time can be modeled along a stream, right? The data in your application flows in a way that you can reason about it because you can say, here is how the state of my application became this way. You can go back, you can go back in time and forward in time, which is kind of the, the key power of the Redux. Who here has used the Redux uh, thing? What, what is it called? The Redux browser? Yeah, like that DevTools. Redux DevTools. Who, who's used that? Yeah, so if you haven't, play with that because it, it sort of perfectly summarizes what reactive programming means, right? Being able to like go back in time uh, and say, hey, let me go back to this state of my application, go forward. That's because we have functions that are executing that can be thought of as singular events happening over time. So, the canonical sort of diagram I like to use when talking about Redux uh, is as such. You have uh, your global store here in the middle, and that is that global state we mentioned. It's immutable. It can't be changed by anyone except the reducers. And so the global store feeds into your views, right? It tells your views exactly what properties they need in an ideal world. Your views may have some internal state, that, you know, like to, to maintain some random bits of information here and there, but really they should get their state from the global store. They should get what they should show, what their current... Uh, display is, so on and so forth. Whenever your views need to change something, they dispatch an action, right? They fire off an action and say, hey, I need to do this, right? And that action gets handled by uh, a reducer, which is a pure function that takes some input, like, hey, what is the action? And then what is the state of the world? And then takes that state and modifies it in some way based on an action. So let's say uh, the state of the world is uh, name equals Osa, and in the view I need to change that from name equals Osa to name equals Dorian. I fire off an action that says, hey, change the name to Dorian. A reducer handles that and says, hey, I got an action called, you know, change name to whatever name should be, in this case, Dorian, and that gets updated in the store. And because the store has changed, each of those views now gets an update. And so the new name should show on the screen as Dorian as opposed to Osa, right? So that's kind of a, a, the feedback loop of built-in applications. Again, recall, the pure functions, uh, in this case, are the reducers and that kind of gets back to functional programming, but more importantly, because in a reactive world we need to understand data flow, we can think about all changes to our view as being fundamentally, you know, events that are occurring over time, right? Events that are being fired, actions that are being triggered, reducers that are being called, so on and so forth. So whenever your view changes, you can think about it not as, you know, someone clicked something and some random thing happened, but no, like here is the exact path that led to that thing changing. Any questions about Redux before we move ahead. Okay, so here's a kind of really interesting example I found uh, when trying to think about Redux. I can anyone see that? If you can't, let me know. Um, but this is a cool example, right? So we want to handle 
uh, the case in which someone successfully logs in, right? So we want to handle that. This is the example of a reducer, right? This is what a reducer would look like if you were using Redux. And so here we're taking the logging success. I'm sure you've seen an example like this. We we'll have a, a pure function here uh, called that we're exporting by default. Rather, when it gets called, rather, or when it gets called, it has uh, a match case here for logging success. If someone logs in successfully, we modify the state, we clone the object, and we set the user logged in in the global state to true, and we return that new state. And so you can think of this as sort of a canonical example. An action gets fired, it gets handled by this reducer, that reducer modifies the state and returns a new state. Happy path. Things uh, are a bit more complicated in real life, but that's sort of the basic example of a reducer. So let's kind of move on to Elixir. Who here has played with Elixir? Okay. Okay. I'm trying to think about how fast I can move through Elixir. It's going to be pretty fast anyway. Uh, processes are awesome. They're the basic unit of work in Elixir. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to like go through Elixir too much because I think we'll kind of talk a bit more about it as we move through the demo. But when I think of Elixir in the context of, of this talk, I think of it as, well, if we're thinking about functional programming, we're thinking about how do we isolate things and keep things immutable. Well, in Elixir, a process is fundamentally immutable, right? It cannot be changed. Uh, it has a unit of work that should execute, like add one plus one or add two plus two. It does its work and it goes away, right? You can change the process only by firing messages to that process that says, hey, would you mind doing this? Would you mind doing that? It has a mailbox that stores those things. Processes in the Erlang virtual machine in the context of Elixir share nothing, right? They don't have any shared state between each other. You can create sort of things in memory they can share between each other, but by default, they share nothing, right? So again, we're still along the same lines of functional programming. We're sharing nothing by default. We're immutable by default. This allows us to kind of think about and tame our complexity by using something called supervision in the context of Elixir. Uh, supervision is quite interesting and I think lends itself to building applications uh, that are cross-platform that are real-time because supervision allows us to model failure in the application. So supervision here can, can be thought of as sort of a tree, right? Because you have individual processes, which can be seen here uh, in this diagram, these individual processes do run independently, but you can assert, right, that there is a supervision tree in place. So you could say that the top level process should supervise the three below it, and that each of those can indeed have processes, processes that they supervise. Well, the question is, why have supervision, right? Well, obviously, the case uh, that, that we can think of most likely is, well, what if you have a process that crashes? So here we have process one, two, and three. What happens when process two inevitably crashes? Because uh, someone, not you or I, because we're great programmers, but someone writes you know, a buggy line of code that causes things to break. Well, in the world you know, we exist in currently, while well, the application goes down, your pretty real-time app no longer is real-time. It's not like not existing at all. And so in the concept of Elixir, you should have a way to respond to that, a way to deal with that failure. Uh, you often hear the term let it crash as part of Elixir, but I think the nuance there is, well, have a way to handle it when it crashes. And concept of supervision does mean that, well, in this case, when process two crashes, uh, its supervisor, the green guy up there, uh, has a strategy. And it, that strategy in this case will be, well, if process two crashes, please just go ahead and restart that process, right? And so that allows you to build very complex topologies similar to this one, where you have nested kind of, you know, restart schemes. You could say, well, I have this top level process that has a million children. If any of them dies, restart all of them. If all of them die, restart none of them. Or take me down as well if, if the, all of them die at the same time. You kind of have complex topologies there, which means that your application, as it you know, encounters strange scenarios, uh, can still respond to failure. This is incredibly important when building real time applications, right? It's not as important if you have a thing that just reads from a database and like shows a page, right? It's, it doesn't really matter, right, to be honest. But if you're building something that has to be real time and respond to user feedback, always be up, similar to like Ericsson and Telecom. If you need something like that, then it means that when things do crash, you need a way to deal with them and you need a way to respond to that failure. And supervision trees are sort of the ideal case. Can you give an example of something that you would expect to crash and then it starts up again mm -hmm. and works? Yeah, yeah. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I mentioned before working for a company that made Wi-Fi routers, right? Uh, and so every router that was in your home, like 50,000 routers in the world uh, that we built, each router had a connection to our server. 
and we maintain a process that was responsible for holding the state of that server or the state of that, that router. So that router uh, has this IP address. Here are all the devices connected to that router at this time. Uh, here are the user settings for it. Oftentimes, uh, we would restart a box, right? Or we you know, would lose power and it, AWS like server rack would go down. Crazy things happen in production, right? And so that's a classic case where, well, you know, what do you do in that case? Let's say uh, you have a process that maintains that state for the server and someone supplies a bad value or uh, some execution during the context of that, a function gets called that does something crazy, that process runs out of memory or gets boom killed, some, something crazy happens. That's a classic case where, well, that process goes down, it goes away, which means that the Wi-Fi router in someone's home has lost a connection to its process. How do you handle that? In usual cases, it's like, well, you know, you don't, you just like, the person calls on the phone and you whine about it. But in our case, we had a supervision tree that maintained all of the connections, all 50,000 connection processes. And so if any of them crashed, it would restart it. And it would rebuild its state from the database, right? So it goes to the database and say, hey, what, should this, what was the last known state for this process? Create a new version of the process, give it that new state, so when the person's router connects back up, voila, it's just as if it never happened. Does that make sense? So the supervisor is basically watching over everything and then saying, that you try to turn it off at that time? Exactly. Or if, it goes, or if it goes off, here's how you turn it back on. Right, or do you turn it back on at all? Maybe you just let it die, or maybe you take the supervisor down as well so that like, we know something bad is happening. Um, think of it as a glorified babysitter, um, but really it, it's a supervisor, right? Manages the processes. And so in our case, we had several supervisors uh, that managed several you know, thousands of children or millions of children processes so that when things did fail in inevitably, uh, we had a way to respond to that. So here's a case where you kind of define a supervisor, right? You've probably seen an example of this before, but all we're doing here is we're importing the supervisor spec. Uh, we're defining who the children processes are. In this case, we have two children, uh, one of whom is also a supervisor, and then one of whom is a worker. And then we're saying supervisor that start link, so start a supervisor process, and these are the children of the supervisor. So these are the folks you should supervise. Uh, this is sort of the classic example. In this case, the supervisor would now manage or babysit two different processes. If any of them crashed, it would respond to that. The strategy there is one for one, which means if any of them dies, bring it back up, right, essentially. Uh, you can have more complex topologies. So you can have a supervisor that doesn't know about his children uh, when it starts. He just knows about the kinds of children it has. Uh, and that can be interesting. Let's say if you have, you don't know the number of children something's going to have. Let's say you're going to have millions you don't know yet. You can say, well, these are the kinds of children you should have. Uh, start them up at will and then manage them moving forward. Any questions about supervisors? I feel like you have another question. No? I can ask you later. So the last kind of bit about Elixir I'm sure you're familiar with is uh, it's a beautiful language. It's very elegant. It's very expressive. Uh, pattern matching, as we can see here, uh, can be quite useful because it lets you do things in your functions that are very, very nice. I won't like stick on this for a while. We can kind of come back to it. But I think it lends itself to building very, you know, rapidly great applications that are highly scalable uh, because you can kind of reason about the code in a way that's much easier. Uh, by contrast, if you use something like Java or like the Aka framework or Scala, it's a lot of code. It's a lot of boilerplate. Whereas in Elixir, it's very simple, very straightforward. You do the thing you do and you check out. Phoenix. Uh, Phoenix, as you know, is the web framework for uh, Elixir or built on Elixir. The most interesting part about Phoenix that we'll talk about today is that uh, it has this sort of, I think, gem built into it uh, called channels, right? Channels, which you were describing just now, are sort of a powerful abstraction around WebSockets to let you do things like routing within your WebSocket, right? So I have, you know, a thousand rooms or a thousand different routes within my WebSocket, and I kind of pass messages to each one. People can connect individually to each one. I can think of them as separate kind of units. That is a really powerful thing. It's, I think, arguably more powerful and interesting than the fact that Phoenix gives you APIs uh, and routing, uh, you know, similar to like a RESTful framework for free. I think channels are the most interesting part of Phoenix, so we'll kind of dive deep there. Uh, the second interesting part of, of channels are presence, so being able to say, well, who are all the folks connected to my channels uh, at this time? Uh, what is the global state of my channels? Uh, Phoenix has a great implementation of that that's based on CRDTs. That is very complex math, neckbeard thing but gives you for free similar to what Slack has, right? These are all the folks who are online right now, right? That's a very hard thing to implement. 
uh, but Phoenix kind of gives that to you for free. We won't talk about that. That might be like a later conversation. We can talk about it afterwards. But I think that's a real gem that should be used when thinking about building real-time apps that are cross-platform. The last thing is that Phoenix, particularly the, the channels implementation, is also cross-platform, right? So you can take your Phoenix web server, create it once, and then there are Phoenix libraries for JavaScript, for the native iOS, for native Android, as well as uh, just the web, right? So you can run your application, your web server, and you can have different clients connect to those web sockets using implementations, uh, all those libraries. And that's really cool because it means you can quickly prototype your web server and then quickly build, build clients that talk to that web server without needing to do a bunch of work yourself. So uh, we'll kind of kind of move quickly through this, but I'm sure you've seen examples. You show some of this, right? Uh, you see examples of how to define a web socket. Uh, those are pretty straightforward. You can assign a user to a web socket. You can connect to it from JavaScript as such, uh, so on and so forth. And you can create individual channels. You know, you can give them names like lobby, so on and so forth. You can do work within those functions. And then you can join those channels uh, from your JavaScript code. Voila, you can also push messages with particular topics, in this case, new message. And then your web server can match against those and do some work with that in mind. The, the kind of key point here to, to recall is uh, you can see here that I'm showing you a JavaScript example, right? And as I mentioned before, React Native is just a JavaScript library, right? So that's the power, right, is we can write our connection to the web server, our client in this case, in React Native in JavaScript once, and we can deploy it to the native iOS code, and we can deploy it to native Android. This is actually quite useful in the context of Phoenix because the iOS libraries have not really solidified around WebSockets really well, uh, and also the implementations of the Phoenix library have not solidified on iOS. So it's actually very powerful that we can utilize React Native here because we can simply write our client once, and it can talk to the same web server with the same JavaScript code. So I think that's a power that we have uh, when using React Native that we might not have in writing native implementations uh, in iOS and Android. So as I mentioned before, presence is really interesting. We're going to gloss over it, but please remind me if you want to talk afterwards about presence, and we can think about how we can extend the application we'll see today to utilize presence and take advantage of it. With that in mind, let's do a demo. So I was playing a race against myself and see how quickly I can get people to a demo because that's always the most interesting part. Um, so in today's case, uh, we're going to look at an application that I've been working on for a little bit of time. Um, and you know, on, on the left, we have you know, sort of a, a Phoenix application. Can everyone see that? Is that better? OK, let's make that even larger or more. OK, cool. So we're looking at, uh, on, on your left, yes, on your left uh, is a web server running Phoenix. And then to your right are just two consoles that I'm going to use to start up the React Native application. Um, so the first thing we'll do is we'll start up our web server, right? I'm going to use uh, iex x mix Phoenix server uh, just so I can have an interactive console attached to it if I need to do any magic. Voila. Then the sort of next bit is we need to, we have this, you know, JavaScript code, this React Native code, and now we want to uh, start up an iOS simulator so we can see what it looks like on an iOS device. We also want to start up an Android simulator so we can look, see what it looks like on Android. So uh, there's some React Native tooling built in. React Native Run iOS starts up an iOS simulator. It takes all of your iOS, your JavaScript code, compiles it to iOS, kicks off a simulator, and you can look at it. And then uh, on the bottom, React Native Run Android does the same thing. However, it kicks off an Android simulator. So let's do the first of those. Uh, as you can see here, I already have a simulator up. So let me close the simulator so you can see that it's uh, indeed a real thing. And I'm not lying to you. Terminate. And I'm going to keep this guy up because it's pretty notorious for being weird. So let's run iOS. Uh, uh, some magic will happen. It will essentially create an Xcode project that all of your JavaScript code gets compiled into, uh, and then that will get kicked off in a simulator, right? So it's, it's just as if you're creating a React Native app, uh, or creating an iOS app using Xcode, um, which is quite powerful. So now we're kicking off our thing. It's starting. It takes a little bit. Loads the dependency graph, loads all your JavaScript stuff, um, and voila, we have a thing, right? Can everyone see that? Yeah? Okay. 
it's pretty large. And the next thing we'll do is we start off the React Native application, uh, but we'll run Android. There's a little bit of magic you have to do to like, reverse your TCP uh, connections to make the simulator work, but then you can simply do run Android. And that is going to build, and then we'll take a look at what it looks like. So compiling a project, uh, setting up a Gradle daemon to make things run a little faster. Interesting. This is the problem with demos. Interesting. Let's do this. Is this even on? That's why. So it looks like uh so got the motion. So we're using a thing called jury motion. Jenny, yeah, I always call it jury for some reason. There we go. Let's start up the device one more time. Ah, yeah, my device. Be close. There we go. Make that a bit smaller. So yeah, we're running an Android simulator, uh, which is a bit notorious to get started, but uh, once you've got it going, it's pretty, pretty handy to run Android. One more time and see if this does its business. There we go. Awesome. Together we can conquer the world. Um, so cool. Let's. Whoa. No, let's not do that. Let's uh, kind of do a demo, right? Uh, so I'm going to join as OSA and uh, I'm going to log in. And then on the other, on the Android platform, I'm going to log in as Dorian. This is, uh, this is what identity theft looks like in real life. In real life. Uh, Wait, it's what? Oh, interesting. Uh, what's going on? Did I do this again? There we go. Let's do Dorian. Okay, so we're connected, right? Uh, so we have an Android device connected to our web socket, and we have an iOS device connected. As you can see here, uh, we can you know see that there are two joins to the room lobby because that's the first thing we do. Uh, we can see OSA is connected, and we can see Dorian is connected. That's the username, so right? Voila. So let's go ahead and add a room. Uh, let's add a room called uh, you know hash rocket. We'll create the room. And voila, you can see that both devices now have the list of rooms, magic. And then, you know, let's, on Android, let's go into the room, right? Let's go into the room uh, and let's just start typing some stuff like, yo, this guy is really tall. Interesting. Okay, so that's Dorian's message. Uh, interesting comment, Dorian. We can join with my OS. We can see, that, you know, yeah, there's message there. Uh, we can say, yeah, I am, dude. Right, you know, messages are coming through. We can say, like, uh, it's born this way. <laughs> like, no way. Right, yeah, so, you know, you get the drift. <laughs> you know, we, we have, in, in very sort of simple fashion a, a basic chat application that is real-time, is cross-platform, is written in React Native, and uses uh, sort of the basic uh, functionalities from channels in Elixir, right? So what's powerful about this is, this is in many cases what you get a client asking you for, right? Like, I want something that's real-time, yeah, and you deliver it, right? In, in very little code, you kind of deliver that to them, and you have a starting point 
for a next discussion or a starting point for a next project or a next sprint because you have these kind of cross-platform tools built in and you have the leverage of Elixir and Phoenix behind you. So let's kind of look into some of the code and, and see what, what it looks like. Any questions before we move on? About the demo or... Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I know what you're gonna say. Say it. What? The Android menu. Yep. Exactly. That's. I have tried that, and no, uh, there's actually a bug in the the React native Flux router uh, library that does all the navigation menus. It's a styling bug, like the CSS that. Uh, the styling for the nav bar on Android needs to be a bit different. Which to your earlier question, right, was in many cases you need to do a lot of, you know, when you use an Ionic or these like terrible frameworks, you have to like do a bunch of if statements, like if Android do this, if iOS do this. In this case, like the application looks the same on Android and iOS except for that bug, right? And that's something that we should not fix in our application. We should fix like in the the, the library we're using, that way all of our future applications are fixed, right? So I think that's a cool thing, is that you can find bugs like that and just file a PR to fix the upstream React Native library, and voila, everyone has the fix, and you don't have to, like, in your code, have a bunch of if statements. But for the meanwhile, yeah, there's an if statement you can do in here to make sure the nav bar shows the add room button and just pulls it in a little bit to the left. Yeah. Good point, though. So. With the Yes. On which device? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, again, I thought this was really cool when I got it working because uh, writing iOS and Android code uh, is very hard, and I respect the guys who do it and the girls who uh, also do it because uh, you can't get stuff like this, like even if you were calling REST full APIs, uh, on two devices from an Android developer and iOS developer without paying them a significant amount of money. Whereas I don't know anything about Android or iOS development and was able to do this, right? So I think that's the power is you can do stuff like this that, uh, you know, is pretty straightforward, uh, but can be shown to someone who's a client and they can be like, hey, that's really cool. I appreciate it. What's up? Uh, are you starting to read state and suck science? No. No, it's like global? No. Well, it's stored in the Redux global state. But it isn't local to the application. It's not like a, uh, it's not like a cached version. Yes. Polling, no. It's getting. It's getting a push to it, right? So whenever you join a room, uh, you kind of like, oh, you're ruining the reveal, man. Uh, whenever you join a room, uh, you get a push from the web server, right? So that's the cool thing, right? I think that's the difference when thinking about building applications using React Native and, and Phoenix is you're not doing constant pulls for things, right? Which is more often than not what, if you talk to an iOS developer, uh, the first thing they'll tell you is like, I refuse to do polling, right? And so in this case, like if I was typing messages one after the other, the only way to do that would be to like poll for new messages every like five seconds, right? However, in this case, whenever you join a room, you get a push with like all the messages, the last 10 or 20, however many you care about. And vice versa, whenever a new message comes in, you also get a push, right? So it's all push-based. There isn't any polling or polling for things because that's precisely how React, uh, that's precisely how real-time apps get really hard to build when you're doing them outside the context of channels or websockets is you have to just, just keep polling for things over and over again, and that's very nasty and ugly and you should do that. What was the second question? Oh, that was, yeah. I had polling, but uh, I'm just curious about the state. I was wondering where it was going. Yeah, stored in the web server. And a web server just pushes it whenever someone joins the channel. And in this case, whenever you go back here, you actually leave the channel. And then when you open it again, you enter the channel again. And so, voila, you get a new message pushed to you, or a new list of messages. Um, I feel like someone had a question over here, but I didn't see. You. Oh, go ahead. OK, cool. So let's look at the code a bit. Uh, actually, I'll stop here and kind of ask. I can go through every single line of code, but I'd much more be interested in like what parts of the code do you want to see. I know like a good place to start, but go ahead. Uh, 
Okay, cool. Um, let's look at that. It's actually not that impressive. So let's blow this up. So the, the main sort of point for that is the, um, the off actions. That's kind of the main place things begin. So, you know, uh, on that login screen, uh, let's do this, do that. Hold on. I'm going to restart my iOS simulator. So on the login screen, you have a username field and a button, right? So when you click the button, uh, what we do is we fire off an action that says join the socket. And what that does is as soon as a user logs in, we join the web socket. And it's honestly very, very straightforward because all we have to do is import the socket uh, class from the Phoenix JavaScript library, so npm install Phoenix, we import the socket library, and then when we do that, uh, we are allowed to do something cool like this. We can set a URL for the web socket we want to connect to, we can define a new socket object, we can do a connect on it, and then we can handle three different message types. If the socket gets opened, we fire off, we dispatch a message which says connect success with a payload that is the socket itself, that way we can pass that along to different parts of the application. Or more importantly, we take that socket that we just created and connected to, we store that in a global state so that every other component can use that same socket to join rooms, create rooms, so on and so forth. And then we handle, obviously, two fairer cases. The case in which uh, the user cannot be connected to the socket because the socket's down. That's why we saw the error message before, right? So I could not connect to the socket because the web server wasn't started. So that is the, 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 the crux of creating the WebSock connection is when someone logs in, we automatically create the connection with a URL, and then we store that in the global state so everyone uh, has the ability to access it. And the last thing we do here is we uh, say actions.main, which just says to the application, uh, go to the main screen. And the main screen in this case is, we log in again as OSA, uh, this is the main screen, right? So when we do actions.main, once we're connected, actions.main says, hey, just go to the rooms list and show the list of rooms, right? So I guess maybe more to your question is, well, when someone goes to the room list and they do an add room, right, or they join a room, what exactly are we doing there? Because that's, that's where the channels and the uh, sort of the, the React usage of, of channels in the case that we, we're talking about here really matters. And we'll look again here at the room actions. And there's a pretty long function here called create and join room. It's a, actually a helper function that's used by other things. Uh, and we'll kind of walk through it a little bit. Recall that I mentioned that the socket is stored in the global state, right? Which means that whenever you click add a room or you uh, join a room, whatever it is you do, wherever you are on the application, once you're logged in, the, that socket is stored in the global state. So you can reference it. You can say, hey, give me that global socket and let me use it in this context. And so what we're doing here is when we create and join a room, we pass in the socket from wherever context we're in. We do socket.channel, which is uh, from the Phoenix library. And we're taking that socket object. We're making a new channel on it. We're giving that channel a name. So room, lobby, room, you know, what do we call that room? Hash rocket, right? Whatever it is, we're sort of taking that, we're creating a name for that room. And we're telling the web server, hey, create this room for us and we can then match on certain things. Once we join the room, we can receive uh, ignores, we can receive errors or timeouts, but we can also, more importantly, receive an okay message. So if we create and join that room in the web server, we dispatch an event which says, hey, I joined successfully. We then give the channel that was just created, we store that in the global state as well, and we store the name of that channel so we can use that later for changing uh, the channel or adding messages to it. Uh, and then we do one last bit of interesting thing here is this line here, actions.roomedit. We redirect the person to the room they just made, right? We take them to a new form and we pass along the name of that. So that's exactly how we get this behavior here where if I add a room, what's occurring here is I'm getting the name of the room, like, you know, Jack's room, and I create it. When I create it, two things are happening. I'm calling that socket.channel, which, you know, creates a new room in the web server or it connects. But remember, in the context of Phoenix, if I create it's the same thing as connecting, right? So if I connect to a room that doesn't exist, the web server, you know, creates it for me on the fly. So what we're doing here is we're connecting to a room called Jack's room. If it doesn't exist, it gets made for, <coughs> it gets made for us. We can go ahead and create. 
and then we get redirected to that room or to a form that shows what that room's contents are. Create, voila, we now have, uh, well, we don't get redirected, we get to the main page, but we can go to here, and then we have sort of a version of what that room looks like. The room is obviously empty right now. If I put some stuff in there, it has some stuff in there. If I go back here, I see that room, it has the message, right? So that's, that's the basic logic. But that kind of begs the question, what exactly does this socket.channel look like when the web server gets it, right? That's sort of the, the meat and bones of the web server. So the socket.channel, if we look at our Phoenix code, uh, is handled in this first function here. So there's a join function that gets created, or you should create, whenever you create a new uh, channel, right? So you have a, a general web socket, and you can create separate channels within it. Each channel is responsible for handling certain messages. And so all we're doing here is, well, we have a match against, if someone tries to join a room, colon, anything else, we take the anything else, we just pattern match against it, and then we add a room, right? We say add room, uh, and all add room does in this case actually is just take that room and put it in like a in-memory list so that we can send back a list of rooms later. Uh, and then we send ourselves an after join. That's it. That's really all that happens is we're on the fly creating a new route within our channel, right? Or a new channel uh, within our WebSocket. And then we're storing that name somewhere so we can keep track of it for other purposes. But you can envision here doing a bunch of other cool stuff, right? You could, uh, for example, here in my after join message, all I'm doing really is after someone joins, I am broadcasting the list of rooms, right? Which, to your question before, do I pull? No. When someone joins, I just send them a list of rooms. Like, hey, here's a list of rooms. Uh, and then, more importantly, I'm getting the messages for that room, right? It's the hash rocket room, so on and so forth, and passing that as well as a broadcast message. So, hey, you just joined this room. Here's a new list of rooms, which includes the one you just joined. And then also, here are all the messages for the room you just joined. Once I'm done with that, you can envision doing all this crazy stuff, right? You could, you know, read from a database and send that back. You can do some, you know, cool business logic. You can do whatever you want here uh, because, again, this is your code. You own it, which is radically different than using something like PubNub uh, or any other sort of, like, pub sub library because, in this case, you control the web server and within a few lines of code, uh, you can do the basic functionality of, you know, joining the web socket, doing the channels and routing, and then you can do more complex things as your clients need them. If your client says, hey, I need you to send a list of rooms, but they all need to be like reversed and capitalized, and I don't want you to show these rooms, only show those rooms, you can do all those things because you know, it is your code, you can kind of control it at will. Is that a timer? Oh. Uh, well, that's actually good. I like that timer because I was just thinking, I think this is the perfect place to stop because... Um, that functionality set is exactly what I wanted to describe to people is, well, you have the ability to have a demo like that, and it takes maybe, I mean, in total, this is like 100 lines of code, but the bits that I added, apart from the boilerplate, are maybe 50 lines of code, and the React Native stuff is, is only, you know, large because I write complex, weird JavaScript. Uh, but the majority of your web server is 50 lines of code, and the majority of your JavaScript application is maybe... 500 lines of code. And in those lines of code, you have what is a working implementation of a cross-platform mobile app that feels responsive, feels native, is real-time. And now you can go do with it what you want. You can either keep using it, or you can decide this startup idea is terrible, let me stop. Uh, you can tell your client, I, I hate you, I don't want to work for you anymore. Whatever it is you want to do, you can do because you haven't invested you know, hours of your time learning iOS, learning React, uh, and learning React Native, uh, you've just learned React Native, and now you can deploy how you want. You can use Elixir and deploy your web service, and voila, you're done. So, any questions about the code before I kind of wrap up? What part in particular? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So let's look, for example, at the uh, room list, which is that list of rooms we just mentioned. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, there's a function that I want to show a room list. Yeah, show a room list. There's a function that I set up when, whenever someone joins uh, that says, hey, uh, whenever I get a new rooms list message, which, as I just mentioned before, we broadcast a rooms list message whenever we add a room or whenever someone joins. If I get a new rooms list message, dispatch an action called new rooms list received. And so we then have within our uh, reducer something that takes that 
list of rooms and updates the global state with that list of rooms. And then we have a function or a JavaScript object called rooms list that is responsible for showing uh, this screen here, right? The list of rooms, hash rockets, so on and so forth. At the very top, when it mounts or when it gets, uh, when it's about to be mounted to the uh, to the view in this case or the screen, uh, we take we join a room. Uh, actually, no, this, is, is this a room list. Yeah, we join a room. In this case, we join a lobby, uh, which is the main room for the application. We create a data source. A data source in this case is just how we take an array of some list of some items and we display them as a list, right? What we want to do here is display a list of rooms, hash rocket, jacks room, and so on and so forth. So the render method, which is the most important part here, just renders a list view, right? Which is a list of things. And uh, we do something called enable empty sections, which doesn't really matter, but we give it a data source. The data source is this dot data source, and then we render a row. And the render row is a function that simply takes a property, in this case, the property being the room. And so all we're doing here is we're taking uh, the render row function, we're calling it here, and that's what individually renders each of those rows, hash rockets, so on and so forth. I actually define a separate uh, method called list item that is also pretty simple. It just takes uh, that kind of room we created, it gets the name for the room, and then renders a new thing called touchable without feedback, which is a, a button or a, a sort of piece of text you can click on. Uh, and we create a view within it and then eventually renders a name field, right? So a bunch of like complex JavaScript just to eventually get to the point where we can click on each of these, display a list of rooms, click on them, and then go back. So my point there is uh, I didn't change, I mean, if you look through this code base, uh, you won't see any lines of code that are like if Android, if iOS, right? It's all the same JSX. Uh, I wrote it once. It looks very similar to React. It feels like React component will mount. All your lifecycle methods are the same. And then I just do a React native run, iOS, or run Android. Question? It does not. Yeah. Yeah, that's the trick. Um, however, if you were building an application that needed to run on all three platforms, right? Uh, you could very easily share a bunch of things in common, right? So, you know, for instance, there are like, your, your reducers, for instance, right? Your actions uh, could be shared generally. Go ahead. Uh, there's a library called the Active Native Web mm -hmm. uh, that allows you to write React code with the Native Web where you will convert like something like review into a good, mm. uh, touchable, mm -hmm. touchable without feedback. So it will go out of this stuff more using Yeah, so I mean, there's kind of two approaches, right? Use a library that eventually cross compiles to something in the web, uh, or just write your code such that you know, the parts that you need to share, the reducers and the actions, are separate and are logically separate, and the parts that don't need to be shared, uh, like the actual views, like in this case, the list items, so on and so forth, are separate and can be pulled out. Um, so, yeah. So, with that in mind, let's wrap up. Um, Unless there's any questions, lagging. Go ahead. I mean, so I think a couple of things. I mean, I think there are secure WebSockets, right, uh, WSS. So, yeah, there's a secure version of WebSockets you can utilize for this kind of stuff. But I think maybe a more fundamental way I think about it is, well, how do you do kind of security when over HTTPS, right? Like, if someone calls your API, you have a mobile device that is running, you know, some piece of code, how does it authenticate against your API or something? Well, it passes a token, right? That's, that's the canonical example. Um, so I, when I think about that, I think there's a couple of approaches. You can either, A, you know, think about some complex solution that implements uh, sessions for WebSockets, or you can just simply say, well, if I have a mobile client that needs to talk to my API, in this case, a WebSocket API, well, it should pass a token as well. If it doesn't pass one, then I reject it, right? 
similar in an API call. Um, that's the way I've approached it when building applications is like, hey, treat the call to my WebSocket the same way I would treat a call to an API. It should pass me something, and if I don't get that thing, I reject it automatically. I think if you start there, I think you, you can get to a, a good place, and then you kind of build complex security logic around that. But I think it's a bit of a, a misnomer to make the argument that like APIs, which your mobile clients already use, are significantly more secure than WebSockets, right? Because they're not. Uh, you just pass tokens around that lets you use the API or not use the API to get some data, right? Is that helpful? Yeah. yeah. So, let's wrap up. Unless, any more questions before I do my like last spiel? Cool. Uh, so, future work. Um, I think that's actually a good piece of future work, right? Like security. How do we think about security? Uh, I think security is a bit on thought when it comes to WebSockets. People are just like, well, it's not secure, or it is secure. Uh, but I think maybe a better question is, how are they secure? How do we secure WebSockets? How do we make sure that people can't just like get push messages from us by pretending to be a client? I think the second kind of area of work needs to be done is, you know, you, you'll see in, in, in the code, which I'll send out to Dorian, it's all like on my GitHub, a bunch of places where I'm doing like some complex, like weird munging of the data that comes back from the server to make it fit what Redux data should look like, right? And that's fine because your reducers uh, always need to manipulate data in some way. Uh, but I think we could do some work to, because we have a Phoenix library that is a JavaScript library, and we have, you know, all this kind of JavaScript already in our code, is there a way for us to bridge the gap between the Phoenix library and the Redux library, right? To make them work a little bit uh, better together. Uh, if you think about you know, this notion of push messages, think about things like observables and RxJS, these notions around like immutability and reactivity are sort of built into Redux by default, uh, but not really built into the Phoenix JavaScript uh, socket library. So maybe there's a place to bridge that gap there and make it a little easier for folks to think about their applications as, as being reactive by default, as opposed to taking the Phoenix channel WebSocket stuff and then trying to like cram it as hard as possible into the Redux ecosystem. I think there could be some, some work to be done there. And I think lastly, uh, maybe some work to be done around uh, making sure that when you do render these views, uh, they do look the way they should on Android and on iOS without having to do significant work. I didn't do any work in my case, but as you mentioned, that kind of tab up top that you weren't showing add room, I think those are simple things that we can just fix because it eliminates a potential reason for people not to use React Native. So uh, thanks, a couple of thanks are in order. Uh, thanks to the hash, the hash Rocket folks for getting me here. Uh, I called, I was like, hey, what's the blue line and how do I get to your office? Uh, so thank you for getting me here in one piece. Uh, thanks to all the folks at Luma, uh, my last company, and the folks at MailChimp who uh, let me come here and speak today. And uh, any questions or further comments or like death threats or anything, now's the time.